Hello and welcome along to another Property Live, everybody. It is so good to be here and uh, at our last Property Live, our last webinar for the year in 2023. We've got such a great webinar coming up for you guys and there are so many new people here at tonight's webinar, which is something that I am particularly excited about. We'll show you the numbers shortly. Now, let's just make sure that everybody can hear us. So if you can hear us, let us know down in the chat. Andrew's got it right in front of him. I'm seeing a couple of comments saying that you can hear us. Yes, Just great. like to make sure the technology's all working. I thought last month was going to be the last webinar. Oh, it was going to be the last webinar, but then what happened was we got 113 pages of new policy from the new coalition. That means the ACT National Coalition Agreement, the new New Zealand First National Coalition Agreement. Uh, we got out the 100-day plan from the national government, the 100-point uh, economic plan, there was a tax plan, there was a fiscal plan, there was a whole heap of documents dropped. And because we got that detail, we knew we had to do one final webinar of the year. We couldn't resist. C couldn't resist it. And you know what? We're going to rip straight into it because there is so much that we are excited to go through tonight. So let's get that shared with everyone and I'll make sure that you guys can see that. Yep. There we go. So today we're going to talk about the five policies that property investors really need to know about in those 113 pages of documents. Look how happy he is. Uh, uh, they, he would, like, he's had that smile on for the last three weeks. I think, I think old when he has. Now, it is important to mention that this is a webinar, so it's not personal financial advice. So what that means is we're going to talk about a lot of opportunities tonight. We're going to talk about a lot of things you could possibly do in your property investment portfolio. But we're not saying that you should actually go and do everything we say. Uh, you've got to interpret this for your own situation. You might like to get some advice about what you personally should do. But we're not telling you that you should actually go and do absolutely everything. Um, one thing I do want to mention is we have had more people than ever sign up for this webinar. Over 4,800 people registered for this. Now, what that means is there's going to be a lot of new faces out there tonight and a lot of new names in the chat. So for you guys who have been around uh, forever to all of these webinars, make them feel welcomed and we might get a few more questions than we usually do. So just keep that in mind. Some people will be new tonight. That does mean as well, we'll cut, go over some things that we might have already covered at previous webinars. But we're so grateful if you are new here tonight, you've never been to one of our webinars before, welcome along. It's so great to have you. And that leads to a really good question that you might be thinking, why should I listen to you guys and who are you? So we're Ed and Andrew. We host New Zealand's number one business podcast, which is the Property Academy podcast. And every single day we release a new episode to teach you something new about property. So far, we've had over 7.6 million downloads, and we are so grateful to every single one of you who has ever tuned in, even to a single episode, because you've contributed to that massive number. Over the years, we've recorded over 1,500 episodes of that podcast. We've hosted over 50 of these webinars. We own New Zealand Property Investor Magazine, and our book is currently in bookstores. Now, I don't say this to brag or say that I'm the best thing since sliced bread. No, I'm just saying... We know a little thing or two about property, uh, and so that's that's how you know that the things we say, they're well researched, and they've kind of stood the test of time. My name's Ed, I'm an economist here at Opus Partners, and I invest in property, and to my right, you're going to see Andrew Nickel, he's a financial advisor, managing director at Opus Partners, and he's got a substantial property portfolio himself, somewhere between 30 to 40 investment properties. Uh, so again, you know that he's got the experience there that you can really rely on. Have we got joy in the house? by the looks of it. Oh, great. We've got some of the good old fans as well. And now, here's what you're going to get if you stick around tonight. You're going to get the webinar for free. We're going to do a Q&A at the end for free, and I'm going to show you how you can ask questions in a second. And this will be recorded, and we will send this out to you at some time, right about midday tomorrow. I know that's a question we're going to see come up in the chat, just letting everybody know so you can respond when somebody does ask that. Now, to get the most out of this webinar, please put your chats in the chat box. So at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's going to be uh, chat and Q&A. If you click chat, put all of your chats in there if you want to talk to other people on the webinar. And there's hundreds of you already on here. If you've got questions... Almost a thousand. Almost a thousand. How many are we up to now, Eight, Andrew? Sorry, 984 and still rising. Excellent. 984 people here so far. Put your questions in the question box because Andrew and I, we're going to be talking, we're going to be presenting throughout this webinar. We don't want to miss your questions. If you put them in the chat, we will miss them. Uh, and one last thing. As you're chatting away, make sure that you send your chats to everyone. 
because again, Andrew and I, we're going to be talking away. We may miss some of your chats. If you put it to everyone, again, there's almost a thousand people here. Someone's going to answer your question. And one of the best things about these webinars is this community that we're building where you can talk back with each other. One final thing I do want to mention is that we're not telling you who's right. We're not saying Chris Hipkins is good or Chris Lux is bad. We're not saying any of that. We're only here to talk about property and it's to tell you how the property focused policies impact you. So I don't want to get into a discussion about the smoking legislation. I don't want to get into a, uh, a discussion about any other policies like education. You know, That's not what we're here for. We're not here to make political statements. We're just here to tell you how the policies impact you as a property investor. And that's what we're going to stick to tonight. And I know that some of you guys, some of you vote Labour. Some of you vote Te Party Māori. Some of you vote Greens or National or ACT or maybe some other party. Maybe New Zealand First or a smaller party that's not in, in Parliament. That's okay. We're not here to, to uh, disrespect each other's political views. It's just to talk about what the policies are and how they impact you as a property investor. I just want to clear that up. So let's get into it. We're going to take you through the five policies that you really need to know that were announced in these 113 pages of policy documents. And Andrew, I'm going to hand you the keyboard so you can go through it and tell us about how property investors are going to pay less tax. Property investors are going to pay less tax under the new regime. And obviously this is still pending legislation. So we're in this holding pattern at the moment. But here's what the guide of the coalition agreement says so far. The government proposes that they're going to restore mortgage interest deductibility for rental properties with a 60% deduction next year, 80% thereafter, and 100% in 2025, 2026. And actually, I should just correct you there, Andrew. It's actually 60% this tax oh, year. Sorry, and too. the financial year from 2023 to 2024. That does mean that property investors are potentially going to get a little bit of a rebate on maybe some of the tax you've already paid. Yeah, pretty exciting. And so I guess for, for any investors out there who have already got rental properties and are finding this interest deductibility coupled with high interest rates really painful at the moment, this is your time to breathe a sigh of relief. This is your Christmas present. So uh, the confirmed policy at the moment is that 60, 80, 100%. Um, and that means that we are actually going to be at 100% deductibility a year earlier than was originally proposed by National. Which is interesting because Ed and I said, look, Act want to have this rolled out straight away. But they're a smaller party. We don't think they're going to have the uh, negotiating power to be able to get this through. I think this is a really good compromise and it does make it more helpful while interest rates are higher. So what does that policy actually look like in practice, Andrew? So imagine you bought this investment property for $600,000 and you bought it in late 2021. And it rents out for $600 a week, so a nice 5% yield. The cash flow under the exist or the, the previous Labour government, which is exactly the policy that we've got at the moment, looked like this. You'd be topping up your rental property by about 30 grand a year and then reducing over time, but basically negatively geared for the next 15 years. So it was pretty brutal. And if you're borrowing 100%, it is normal to top up a rental property in the earlier days. But as time goes on, you do want it to kind of get to a, a, a neutrally geared or positively geared point. And this instance only happens in year 14. Now, just walk us through, Andrew. A lot of people may never have seen that graph. Good what point. are we looking at there? So what we're looking at here is we're looking at the amount of money that an investor would have to top up the rent to meet all of the costs. So by the time you factor in your rates, your insurance, your maintenance, and your mortgage interest, but also the tax on top of that, under the current interest rates that are now forecast, you'd be looking at negative cash flow over a 15-year period of $131,000. So quite a lot of input. And it's important to say that is 15 years. So each of those bars is one year that you're going through and obviously improves over time. So what does the cash flow look like under the new policy, Andrew? So new policy... Pretty exciting. So yes, you've still got those first five years which are negatively geared. Not the end of the world because then you've got 10 years where you're neutrally or positively geared. And so the total cash input, the total negative cash flow over, well, the, the five years, I guess, is $58,600. So a significant difference. And it means that 
basically for going from the Labor policy to the new policy or the proposed policy, you're going to be better off as an investor, based on that example, $72,400. That's the amount of tax that you won't have to pay anymore. It's really interesting to note as well, if I just flick back to the, those um, differences, and we'll just pull in the Labor one first. Notice how, if you just look at the left-hand side, which is the first five-ish years, the real benefit of this policy doesn't come in the first couple of years because you're still negatively geared while interest rates are high. The real benefit comes after somewhere between five and up to 15 years. So over the long term, you're going to be significantly better off under that policy because you will save up to about $72,000 worth of tax just in that specific example. Now, Andrew, let's talk about what happens to the property market when interest deductibility goes. Okay, so if you're an investor and now you're going to pay less tax than you thought you were going to back last year, then that makes investing more profitable. It makes it more lucrative for you as an investor. That leads to more people saying, you know what, maybe I'll invest in property. And that leads to increased demand and that will push, that will push up prices potentially. What's important to note, though, of course, is that we are talking about five major policies here. This is just one of them. And so while interest deductibility should push up the demand for properties, there are some other ones that will also increase supply that we also need to think about. The next major policy that I want to talk about is the new rules for renters. And I think this is going to be really, really important. So if we look at the National Act Coalition Agreement, and again, we pull it up, what this is going to do is it's going to allow landlords to issue a 90-day notice to a tenant to end a tenancy. Now, this was really, really important, but it got taken away over the last six years. There are also some other changes that I'll talk about in a moment. But this is the big one. Because let's say that you're a landlord and you're renting out this property here. A nice young man called Andrew Nickel comes along. He looks trustworthy. And you think... Needs a shave. Yeah, and he wants to rent your property. And you think, he looks like a nice young man. I'm going to rent my property to him. But what happens if Andrew Nickel turns out to be a bit unsavoury? What happens if that Andrew Nickel ends up being into some illegal substances or ends up turning a bit dodgy? Well, previously, it was very difficult to get rid of Andrew in that case. But what this new policy allows you as the investor to do is say 90 days, then you're out. Now, this policy, the 90 days, is often not used that much by a lot of property investors. In fact, some polling by the uh, Property Investors Federation showed that only about 2% of property investors ever actually use that clause. But it is a little bit of uh, an insurance policy in some ways. It's a bit of protection to say, if I do get a really bad tenant, then I am able to get rid of them. You see, under the previous Labor policy, you had to go through some pretty intense processes before you could give notice to a tenant to leave. In fact, you needed three uh, instances of antisocial behaviour before you could ask them to leave uh, legitimately, and often you'd need evidence for that. And I'll give you a really interesting example. In an upcoming property... Uh, uh, Academy podcast episode, we talk about one property investor. She's not one of ours. She wasn't one of our clients, uh, but her name's Poppy, and she might actually be here at tonight's webinar. And she recently sent us an email saying that she bought an investment property in South Auckland. She rented it out, and it took a while to get a tenant there. In the end, her tenant wasn't really of very good character, and unfortunately, she got $7,000 behind uh, in rent. On top of that, there were some gang connections, there was some drug use in the property, and it was really difficult under the current policy settings for Poppy to get rid of that tenant, uh, even though she was racking up a lot of arrears and there was you know, disrespectful uh, behaviour when it comes to, to Poppy's property. And I think, again, like you said before, this is the very low level of instance that this actually is necessary. But you know what? As a landlord, when you're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars, often you do want that, that safety net to know that, hey, if something is really, really bad, I can get rid of someone. Um, I, I don't see many investors using this just to kick people out. I don't think that's going to be a regular thing um, because 
we as landlords want to keep people in as long as possible. This is just something that's uh, in case of emergency. I think that's absolutely right because we want long-term tenants, right? One of the big things um, landlords worry about or property investors worry about is not having a tenant. So we don't have an incentive to kick someone out. We've got an incentive to keep them for as long as possible. So I don't think this is going to be used uh, uh, in, in a really, really negative way. Now, there are some other changes in there as well. You would have seen pet bonds. Now, this was a bit of a surprise in the ACT National Party Coalition Agreement. So previously, if a tenant had a pent, you basically, you couldn't charge them any more rent uh, to protect yourself. Now what in the ACT National Coalition Agreement, what they're saying is you'll be able to charge a little bit extra rent so that uh, you have some extra leeway or some extra protection if a tenant has a pet and unfortunately it does cause some additional damage there. Previously you weren't able to do that. So there was never really an incentive to take a tenant who had a pet versus a tenant who didn't have a pet. If they were exactly the same, some landlords would say the person with a pet seems a little bit more risky. Now that you can charge an extra bond, you can cover some of that risk. And so I think that's going to be a real benefit is there. There are some other things like the shortening down of how much notice both tenants and landlords or pro tenants and property investors have to give. Uh, but those are the main ones that I wanted to mention. Now, if we're thinking about what does that actually mean in practice, uh, if we're thinking about demand and supply for property investors. So I think the main thing is that investors will perceive less risk. So at the margin, I think more people will invest. I don't mean that there's going to be a rush of property investors because they were all waiting for that 90 day rule to come in. It's probably a bit of a minor change, but at the margin, it will probably make investors think, you know what, it's a little bit easier to become a property investor. You know what? there's a little bit more protection. I'm going to give it a go. And because of that, I expect more people to invest and then at the margin, we will see demand start to go up as well. And Andrew, I see that you want to say something. Yeah, just one question that Ming's asked, and I think now's the right time to uh, ask, answer this. Do you have to give any evidence or reason to implement the 90 day uh, uh, exit? Well, that's the benefit of the new 90 day clause or the, the 90 day clause that's coming back. It's a no reason termination. And in fact, Andrew, tell us the story. I know that there's a very well-known property investor uh, who you were Peter on Peter Lewis told me off. Peter yeah. Lewis I was on a, uh, uh, a webinar with. And um, so we said, so so the, the term is no cause terminations. No to cause termination because you don't have to give a, a reason. Anyway, he said, we should never say that. It, it's never a no cause. There's a cause. We're just not stating what that reason is. Um, so, so he calls them no disclosed cause terminations. I think the main benefit there is that there often is a reason, but sometimes you don't want to get into those arguments with tenants about some yep. of those reasons. And that's the benefit. The issue isn't that, hey, in the past we had to give a reason. That was, really, uh, that was uh, an issue. The issue was that the process you had to go through to prove that reason was a bit too much. Now, what I'm really interested is to hear from you. One of the cool things we do at these webinars for anybody who is new is we go back and forth. We get to run some polls and see what you think. So I'm going to put a poll across your screen that asks, what do you think about the 90 day rule changed? Does it give you real peace of mind? Do you not really care? Or perhaps you're against it because you think it's bad for tenants. And that is a legitimate thing that some property investors think. So I'm going to put that poll across your screen and we're going to find out what the 1,300 of you guys sitting at home actually think about this. And just while you're answering that, I'll just remind everyone because I'm seeing some really good questions in the chat. We will miss those at the end. If you want your question answered, put it in the question and answer section just so that we make sure that we get as many of them as we can at the end of the webinar tonight. Fantastic. So we've got over 750 of you guys having answered that poll. I'm going to close that off in three, two, one. I'm going to end that poll and share those results with you. And so what you guys can see now is about 88% of you, 725 of you said this gives you some real peace of mind. Some of you, about 10% say, actually, I don't really care about this. And 2% are saying, yeah, look, I'm actually against it. I think it's bad for tenants. And that's a legitimate point of view as well. We were recently speaking at the Property Managers Conference down in Wellington. Uh, and, and David Faulkner, who is from Property Brokers, quite a large property 
uh, management company was saying actually he disagrees with it as well. He thinks it's important uh, that tenants have that ability. Look, the main thing is that um, we're allowed to all have these opinions as well. I see some people asking down in the uh, down in the chat as well about how our on-air sign is off. We only turn that on when we do our podcast videos. That's the reason why we don't have it on. It's not because we are, um, are trying to save money in particular <laughs> on power. But... Um, that's probably a nice idea as well. Now, Andrew, there is another large policy that is going to come in, which is potentially some new mortgage rules for borrowers. Yeah, why would you go with the Uber Eats bag? Because back when this policy initially came in, yeah. uh, the banks were looking a lot at what was happening. Oh, at, right. Gotcha, gotcha. They were looking at what you're spending. Okay. They were looking at what you're spending on Uber Eats and also on coffee as well. So the coalition agreement, I can't believe I borrowed any money in that time. The coalition agreement says they want to rewrite the Credit Contract and Consumer Finance Act to just focus on what it was originally intended to do, which is to protect vulnerable consumers without unnecessarily limiting access to credit. And what that means basically is when they brought out the triple CFA, it was to stop loan sharks. But what's happened is it's become this all-encompassing uh, uh, regulation that stopped banks from just lending money to people who maybe are spending more on coffees than they, uh, than they will in the future because... They don't have a mortgage at the moment. So they're able to actually readjust their way of spending. Let's have a look at the history of house prices. So when we think about all the things that have occurred in the last you know, 10 years, you look at things like the Brightline test coming in in 2018. Well, that wasn't even 10 years ago. Um, did that stop house prices going up? Absolutely not. And if you look at 2019 when ring fencing was brought in and healthy homes regulation, did that stop house prices going up? Absolutely not. And then their tenancy laws in 2021, and then the new tenancy laws again in February 2021, uh, what? Uh, um, I yeah. think that's a typo. <laughs> yeah. I should have said August yeah. 2020. Yeah. And then we've got the interest deductibility rules in March 2021 and the Brightline test extension. All these things that maybe you think, God, it sucks to be a landlord right now. And then LVR restrictions get tightened again. But you know what actually did make a difference? You know what actually, what was the straw that broke the camel's back? Well, back in November 21, when the triple CFA came in and really affected borrowers, that's what affected house prices. And I've always said that the number one cause of house price decreases is the lack of finance, the inability to get finance. If you can't get finance, you're probably not buying a house because, let's face it, we don't have cash to buy houses. We have to borrow money from the bank. And just to remind ourselves about what the issue was with the triple CFA is that was back in the end of 2021 and kind of up to mid-2022. We saw all of these articles about first-time buyers and investors not being able to get money from the bank because they were spending too much money on coffee or because the bank thought they were spending too much money on Uber Eats or Netflix. And what the banks ended up doing was they created new software or bought new software where they would scan your bank statements and put everything you were spending into 17 different buckets. And so again, if you weren't already living as if you had that mortgage that you're applying for, then it, they would think that you weren't able to afford it. Whereas what would usually happen in the past is the banks would say, okay, yeah, maybe you're spending a little bit more, but people tend to spend the money that's in their bank account. And generally what happens is when you get a mortgage, you start spending a little bit less because you've got a mortgage and you actually want to pay it. And so that was the change that happened with the triple CFA. Now, if people, if, if we change that, we'll probably see people being able to borrow more and that will impact the property market. But one thing I'm really interested in, Andrew, is to find out what people actually thought or how it actually impacted people's ability to borrow. And I'll just make sure that I can share the screen again. So let's look at the number of... Sorry, Sorry just, just switch quickly click all through um, all so, of this. While he's doing that, um, someone said uh, uh, they didn't really think that the triple CFA affected borrowers because you could just basically uh, change your spending habits over the course of three months 
and then apply for your loan? Well, you know, theoretically that's true. So if you wanted to eliminate your Candy Crush addiction and your your um, your casino visits and your wine subscription, all those kind of things, your Netflix, you could absolutely uh, stop making those payments for three months. But there was still a lot more tightening that came with that policy. Well, they, let's look at the data. Okay. So uh, in terms of the number of residential loans that were um, issued over that time, June 2020, COVID lockdowns, a massive drop. Now, this is, again, for a rolling three months. Then, of course, triple C CFA comes in uh, in 2021. Again, we saw a massive drop over that period. And when I say massive drop, let me put that into perspective. So in December, sorry, I'm just going to get there. December uh, 2020, that is. Yeah, 81,900. In May 2022, only 45,400 loans. It was about but a 40% decrease in total. That's huge. So again, yes, you're right. You could absolutely eliminate some of those costs, but the number of residential loans was down by 40%. at significant. So three months before the triple CFA rollout, 76,000. There was a 16% decrease. Uh, and at the time of the triple CFA rollout, 64,000. And three months later, 47,000. So absolutely the data would suggest that less people were taking out loans, less transactions were happening. If less transactions happen, there's less demand, those prices are going to slow down. And we show those numbers, it's really important to mention, because it's not like the triple CFA came in and it, the switch got turned on in a single day. Banks were gearing up to this in the three months before it came in. And so that's why I wanted to show you that massive decrease over time. Now, what happens if the triple CFA goes, Andrew? People will find it easier to get a mortgage. And again, uh, sometimes it's also it's just the media that goes around this. So when people were being told that their Kmart spending was going to be scrutinised and their Uber Eats was going to be scrutinised, Probably fewer people thought, you know what, I don't want to go and get a decline from the bank. I'm just going to sit this one out for a little bit. So as we start to see some positive news again, people will think, hey, you know what, maybe I can get a loan. That means more people can afford to invest or buy a property for themselves. And as a result, more people will actually go out and do that. And that results to an increased demand. Okay, so those are a lot of the demand side policies that we wanted to take you through. There's one policy that I know that so many of you guys here today have been asking about on social media and before we came in here, and we it, that is the bright line test. So I want to mention that now as we get into it, because this is one of the things that so many of you have been texting in and emailing in about uh, in advance of this. So let's talk about the bright line test and what Did it means. Did you put a sparkle on my tooth there? Yeah. That's... <laughs> what do I, Ben Rumble? Oh, I thought it, I thought you looked quite fetching with it. So one of the issues around the Bright Line test is there wasn't anything about it in either New Zealand First or Axe Coalition Agreement. And so what those coalition agreements actually said, and actually this is quite an important point, they said if there's something not mentioned within the coalition agreements, then both Act and New Zealand First agree to support what was in National's fiscal plan, tax plan, 100 point economic plan and 100 day action plan. Now, what's really important to note is that the bright line test changes were in National's back pocket blue boost plan, which is their tax plan. It is also in the 100 point economic plan, point number 20 in there. So this is government policy, but because it wasn't mentioned in the coalition agreements, it's often been glazed over. Now, if we want to look at the detail of the Bright Line, and I know so many of you are asking me about this, what National want to do is by July 2024, so by July next year, they want to shorten the Bright Line test back down to, July, uh, to two years. Now, what that means is if you bought a property before July 2022, even if you bought it at a time where there was a 10-year Bright Line test, you will not be subject to the Bright Line test. So you will be outside of it. If you've currently got a 10-year Bright Line test, that will shorten down to two years. Let's get into the detail because this is really important. So if you look at the numbers right now, if you have a property and you purchased it before December 2018, you are currently outside the test. You're right outside it because you bought it when it, there was either a two-year or a five-year Bright Line test or maybe none, and so you're not affected by it. If you bought a property between December 2018 and March 2021, 
you've got a five-year Brightline test. I've got a couple of properties that, that currently have that five-year uh, Brightline test within there as well. And between March 2021 up to now, a 10-year Brightline test, unless you bought a new build, there are, there are some differences in there, but for most people, it's going to be a 10-year Brightline test. Here's what happens under the new policy. So they expect they're going to bring it in by July 2024, which means that if you bought a property before July 2022, you are going to be outside the test if National do exactly what they said they were going to do. I put that disclaimer in there because we all know that politicians sometimes don't always do that. <laughs> if you bought a property after July 2022, at that point in time, you will have a two-year test from the point that you purchased it. So by the time they implemented it, if you bought a property in August 2022, in a month's time, you know, by August 2024, you're going to be outside the bright line test. So that is going to be really good news for any of you who purchased a property and are really struggling with those higher interest rates right now. Not only is this a National's Back Pocket Boost plan, their tax plan, when we were hosting an event alongside the Tauranga Property and Business Association, we had Tama Portica, who is the MP for, I believe it's Hamilton West, he came along and again, he confirmed that this is their intention for the Brightline test, that if you purchase when you had a five or a 10 year Brightline test, that will shorten down to two years. Now that will have some impact on demand. Maybe some people will say, you know what, because the Brightline test is gone, I'm going to go buy some more properties. But I think it's really going to have an impact on the supply side of the market. Because when they introduced that policy in July 2024, I want to show you how many people all of a sudden will no longer have a test. Over 250,000 properties were bought between July 2019 and July 2022. So when they bring in that change, bam, 250,000 properties are no longer subject to the Brightline test and can be sold without paying capital gains. That means that we could see a lot more properties come on and list on the market, which could increase supply. Now, not all of those 250,000 are going to be property investors. Absolutely not. But perhaps somewhere between 30 to 40% might be. Well, I mean Remember, it's also, uh, if you have a holiday home, that's um, captured by the bright line. Correct. Now, if we just focus on the numbers, 30 to 40% of investors of those could be investors, which means that somewhere between 75 and up to 100,000 properties could no longer be subject to the bright line test. Not all of those are going to be listed, but some of them will be. It's quite interesting. Uh, as I was preparing for this webinar today, I was sitting at a cafe and some friends of mine who own a significant uh, rental property portfolio, residential portfolio, said we are just waiting for the Brightline test to go before we start selling those properties. Uh, so I do expect that we're going to see a little bit of movement there. We'll see if it's enough to keep house prices down. Now, I'll tell you why this is really important, because let's say that you bought a property back in March 2020, and let's say that it was the average property in Christchurch. That property would be worth about $514,000. Now, if that property that you purchased in March 2020 perfectly followed the market, today it would be worth about $741,000. That's an increase of like 227 k just an enormous return. And the thing is, you might be holding that property now and you bought it when interest rates were, what, like 3%, maybe 3.5% before they really started to fall when we got into COVID times. Well, that 7% interest rate you're paying today or 6.5% interest rate, depending on when you fixed it, that might be really hurting. But you might be saying, you know what, I really don't want to sell it because of the Brightline test. Well, let's talk about how much tax those new rules could save you. So... The property, as we said, has increased in value by about $227,000. Now, under the new rules, under the old rules, you still would have had to pay for a real estate agent, some legal costs, some staging, some advertising. We usually estimate that at about 5% of the property's value. So let's call it $37,000. But the big difference is that if you're captured under the Brightline test and pay 39% tax, you'd have to pay up to $74,000 in tax if you sell it. Under the new rules, you won't have to do that. So that is a real incentive where there are some property investors out there who are saying, holy heck, the interest rates are killing me, but I do not want to sell because I don't want to pay that $74,000 in tax. So I'm going to hold on till I'm outside of the bright line test. Well, as soon as that changes, 
and you don't have to pay tax anymore, you might say, do you know what? I'm going to sell it because I'm going to be able to take $190,000 home rather than $116,000 home. When you think about it as a 10% 10, 10 premium on your, on your property value almost, it's a big difference, isn't it? It is a massive difference. And so I think we're going to see some changes in behaviour. And one thing that I want to uh, ask you guys as well is I just want to get a bit of a sense about where your guys' heads are at. So I want to put another poll across your screen and I want to understand from you guys, are you planning on selling a property when the bright line test changes? Is it, yes, you can't wait for it? Is it, no, nah, you're in it for the long game. It's not going to change whether you sell or not. Or maybe you're not a property investor just yet or it wouldn't affect you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put that poll across your screen and we're just going to get a sense of where the 1,400 of you sitting at home are uh, with your property investment journey. This is going to be some really interesting data. So let's see. The cool thing is, wow. you guys can't see this, but Andrew and I have that got the data in front really of us. That's really wild. There's a lot of people saying that they can't wait for it. And that, that probably just goes to show that there are a lot of investors right now where cash flow is really hurting. Because most people, if the cash flow wasn't hurting them, they'd hold on to the property for another 10 years. What difference does it make? But if you are really hurting from a cash flow perspective right now, this is a consideration and it's a higher percentage than I thought. Okay, well I'm going to close that poll in three, two, one, and I'm going to share the results with you all. So what we can see here is 163 of you here at the webinar tonight of basically a thousand people, 17% of you have said, yes, I can't wait for the rules to change. I'm going to be selling a property. I'm going to be outside of the Brightline test. 62% of you are saying, no, I'm in it for the long game. Brightline test change, not going to impact me much. And 22% of you are saying, hey, it didn't affect me anyway, so I'm not really going to change my behaviour. But what how, what percentage did you think that was going to be, Andrew? So it's come through at 17%. I, how big did you think I, it was going to be? I thought probably less than 10 Less than 10%? Yeah. 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 I think there are definitely some property investors out there, especially if you've purchased when uh, those interest rates were a little bit lower. And you might say to me, Ed, well, how much of a difference is this really going to change to supply? Well, as you can probably guess, we've got some numbers for you. So what you can see here is the number of new listings coming onto the market. Now, the Brightline test was first introduced in 2015. And at that point, just under 130,000 properties were being listed on the property market per year. Now, the Brightline test got extended in March 2018. And between those two points, we saw 13,000 less properties listed per annum between that time period. Now, what's interesting there is that is about a 10% decrease in the number of new listings coming to the market. And what that tells me is that people are holding on to their properties longer than they otherwise would. So people who would usually say, you know what, I'm going to sell my property, are now saying, I need to hold on to this because if I don't hold on to this property, I'm going to have to pay a lot more tax. Let's look at the difference that happened only a couple of years later. The Brightline test got extended again in March 2021, and between those two dates, we saw about you know, just under 8,000 less properties listed per annum on the market. The dip there, of course, was due to COVID. And so again, between those two periods, we see fewer properties coming to the market. And of course, between then and now, we're seeing about an extra 18,000 fewer properties coming onto the market. So we've gone from 130,000 properties being listed on the market every single year back in 2015. We're now at about 90,000 properties being listed on the market every year. That's 40,000 fewer properties coming to the market, which means there's less supply out there. There's fewer properties available to buy. It's about a 30% decrease. And you can see every time the Brightline test was extended, we saw fewer properties coming on. Now look, this trend, it's not fully down to the Brightline test. It's not just the Brightline test that was happening during this period. We saw other changes. We saw COVID come through. We're in a really quiet market. It's arguably not a very good time to sell a property. So some of this will be natural behaviour. But what we do know is since the Brightline test first came in, we're seeing 30% fewer properties being listed on the market compared to when the Brightline test, uh, but compared to when we didn't have a Brightline test. So what this is saying to me is when we reverse these changes, once we go back to having a shorter Brightline test, we could see more listings come through and 17% of you sitting at home are saying, yep, we can't wait for that Brightline test to come off. We're going to sell our house. So what does that mean? 
What happens when the bright line test comes off? There will be some demand factors, but I think that because investors can sell without paying tax, more people are going to sell. That's going to cause listings to go up, and then the short-term supply is going to go up as well. That's something that I haven't seen talked about in the media yet, but it's something that's really important to understand when you're making a property investment decision. What that means is that there will likely be more properties available for you probably in about January or February next year, once the Brightline test starts to change, or perhaps into July, once they actually change the rule of it, once we get some clarity there, I think people are going to start selling their houses and you guys are saying, hey, look, we're going to be some of those people who are. Okay, Andrew, let's talk about Holy the final moly. policy. Uh, we've got the YMCA member here. So we think that there's going to be way more building consents come through. Now, this is really interesting, right? Yeah, so if we look at the number of consents that have been issued over the last year, it's seriously dropped. And the reason for that is because there's no money in it right now for a developer. So the margins for developers have been squeezed drastically. It's really hard for them to get lending. It's really hard for their clients that are buying the properties to get lending. So a lot of them are just going to sit on the sideline and build these houses for a period of time. Now, as a result, because this is a relatively um, slow ship to turn, because let's say, let's say now you've got a few developers that are thinking, you know what, I should get back into the market. Well, they've got to go on their Christmas holiday, they've got to come back, they've got to start looking for land, they've got to make some offers on land, they've got to get the offers accepted, they've got to draw down the loan and buy the land, they've got to apply for the consents. There's quite a long process here. As a result, I do think you're going to start to see a bit of upward momentum in the consents. So let's talk, Andrew, specifically about what's in the New Zealand First National Coalition Agreement, yep. because there's some interesting things. A really interesting one here. They propose to amend the Building Act and resource consent system to make it easier to build a granny flat or a unit on the back of your any small structure up to 60 square metres, which is Pretty significant, requiring only an engineer's report. So what does that mean? Well, that means if I've got a property and I've got some backyard, well, rather than just have some empty lawn there, I can now carve off a part of that and I can put a little granny flat on there. Good old 60 square metres. Yeah. And it's interesting that they've, they've put it under seniors policy. So if you look at the coalition agreement, they didn't put it under construction policy. They didn't put it under housing policy. They put it under seniors policy. Why do you reckon that is? I think it's because New Zealand First yeah. tend to promote the cause of older New Zealanders, which is great. It's awesome that there's somebody out there representing them. And so this is probably something that they have heard from some of the people who support them. Which is, I mean, I guess if you've got some, um, uh, particularly because there's more um, intergenerational uh, uh, families living together now, and with net migration numbers up, you could expect that maybe you, you will have um, some older people, or, you know, Ed will just want a place to start my house. So here's how the numbers might look. Let's say that minor dwelling costs a couple of hundred thousand dollars but you can get $550 a week rent for that. That's a gross yield on your spend of 14.3% on the money that you've invested. And that is a huge return on investment for what's just basically been carving off a little bit of land in your backyard that's currently unencumbered. It's important to mention that a lot of that return really comes from chopping off part of your land. You might not be subdividing it, but you're going to be giving up some of the use of your own home. So while it's an additional $200,000 that you're going to spend, just bear in mind that it's because you're effectively getting the land for free in this instance because mm. you already own it. But if you guys are out there really struggling with those higher interest rates, this might be one thing you can do to improve your cash flow because it looks like it's going to come become a wee bit easier. One thing that we do want to mention though is we're still waiting on more details of this. We don't know when it's going to come out, but it's something that I kind of saw and thought this is going to be interesting because building a minor dwelling, that is kind of a classic property investment strategy that a lot of people at least consider. One thing that's interesting is the medium density rule. So do you guys remember, probably back in, I think it was 2021, where Judith Collins, Zickler Willis and Megan Woods came out David Parker there on the TV screen as well, and they announced the medium density residential standards. And this was such a big deal at the time. It was a massive deal because it meant that you didn't need to apply for a resource consent if you were going to do a couple of things. So you could bowl down your house and you could build three new townhouses. As long as you met certain rules, you didn't actually need to follow it if you were in some of the major councils in New Zealand. 
You could bowl your house down and build three new apartments. Maybe you live in the top one and you rent out the bottom two. Or if your house was at the front of your section, maybe you could build two new townhouses on the backyard. So that was quite exciting and maybe something you guys at home might be considering. It looks like that policy is basically dead in the water now because councils do not have to follow it anymore. Whereas in the past, there was legislation that said, you have to follow us, not follow this. No ifs, no buts, you have to follow it. The other thing that's really interesting is while councils can still follow these rules if they want, they need to ratify it. Now, what that means is that the councils all have to get together and vote for those new rules to come in. In most cases, I think it's pretty unlikely that those rules are going to be ratified or approved by councils. The reason I say that is the whole reason that the medium, de uh, medium density residential standards were coming in is because councils sometimes find it hard to make decisions because you've got perhaps 21 councillors sitting around the table and they're not always able to agree on things. I think generally speaking, these standards are gone. Uh, you've probably missed your chance to use these if you're into them. Yeah, I, we, I, I can't think of any investors that I worked with that actually used this policy. Now, there are some other things that should increase housing supply anyway. First of all, the national government planned to repeal the RMA and introduce a fast-track consenting regime. We're waiting on some details of that. They're planning to pay councils to consent more properties. So if councils consent more than their five-year average, they get a share of a $1 billion pot of money. But there's one that I really want to talk about, which is that they want to force councils to rezone land for 30 years of population growth. Now, Andrew, you know a bit about this because that's what the government did back during the Christchurch rebuild. And all of these blue areas, those are the large parts of land that were changed from rural land to land you could build on. What was that like back in the day? Because you were living in Christchurch then. So I remember, and I know we're going to talk about Hallsall in a minute, I remember a lot of the investors that I was, work that I was working with started investing in this place called Horsall, which was an established suburb. But as you can see from the, the map, there was a lot of uh, rural uh, area where there wasn't a lot of development. And, you know, fast forward 10 years now, there has been a significant amount of development and, and actually filled in those gaps and then increased infrastructure. It's really become quite a, a nice suburb. Let's actually talk about that because this is what I want to show you what happened in Christchurch because this could show you what might happen in your area if you're not currently living in Canterbury. So this is Horswell back in 2008. This is Murphy's Road, I think it is. And as you're scrolling around, if you were to do it this... It looks quite rural there. It's incredibly rural. It's all paddocks. It's a little farm road there. It's definitely not two oh. lanes. And that is what Horswell looks like back in 2008. Well, that part, that part of Horswell. That um, part of Horswell. Yeah, yeah, that part of Horswell. And I actually, it's funny, I remember one of my investors, Steve, came from Wellington. And um, he was looking at a property down here. And I remember he got here and he said, Whoa. We won't tell Ruth about this, his wife, because he said that she would absolutely flip her lid if she saw that, thinking this is he's off his head investing there because it's a panic. Well, let me show you what it looks like today. So this is exactly the same spot on exactly the same street. And this is in 2019. This is four years ago. So you can see, yep, there are some sections there that are ready to be built upon. Those will definitely have houses yeah, on there do. since it's uh, now 2023. But that's the sort of change that we might start to see because this government is really interested in Greenfield's development. So if you're somebody who's interested in investing in new build townhouses, this is the sort of thing that you might start to see in your specific areas. And what does it really mean if we start to see more land rezoned for residential? Well, there'll be more land available, which means that developers will find it easier to negotiate because there are more, there's more land that they can go and potentially purchase. Section prices are probably going to start to stall or perhaps even become slightly more affordable. That'll make it more profitable to build as property prices start to rise. Ultimately, I think this will draw more developers into the market and mean that current developers start to build more. And on top of that, that'll be that the long-term supply of properties starts to go up. And so this is really interesting. We've got some policies coming out of the national government that are increasing demand. There are some policies that are going to increase supply. And so just to wrap up, I want to add it all up and ask, what does it actually mean for house prices? Well, if we think about those tax changes that we first talked about at the start of the night, the interest deductibility, I've put two arrows up there because I think we're really going to see some increase in demand from property investors there. 
I've also said that it could have a small increase in supply. Now I'm suggesting that because perhaps there are some of you who are thinking, I'm gonna sell my property. I think that these, these tax changes are so tough that I'm actually gonna sell. Well, perhaps you're not gonna sell anymore. So that could slightly increase supply mm -hmm. compared to what would otherwise have been the case. And so they could increase demand, could also increase supply compared to what would have otherwise happened. Those tenancy changes, there might be a small increase in demand there because as we said, property investors say, you know what, little bit less risk. That's going to be the thing that finally encourages me to go ahead and purchase that investment property. The triple CFA, it depends how the banks implement them. So I haven't said double arrow up, you know, massive increase in demand, but it could have a small increase depending on how the banks interpret it. And we've talked about that on the Property Academy podcast recently about how the banks have invested a lot of money into new software systems. We'll see how much they roll them back, but it could have a bit of an impact there as they start to compete for market share. But the bright line test, yeah, it could increase demand a little bit. I think we will really start to see it have its impact as more on the short term supply. So what's important to remember though is that over time, while the bright line should increase listings, it's probably not gonna last for the next 10 years. It's you guys who are really waiting to sell your properties now we might have some short-term increase in those listings where we're going to see some real supply changes in those consent changes over the long term. But it is going to take time for that to actually come in. So we've got some things that are going to increase demand. We've got some things that are going to increase supply. So we've got to weigh it up to say, well, what do we think is actually going to happen to house prices over the next year? And so I want to put another poll across your screen cool. and ask you, how much do you think house prices are going to go up next year? Do you think it's going to be over 8% or 8% or over? Somewhere between 4 to 8%, nothing to 4%, or perhaps you think that they're going to fall and uh, go, go down. This is I'll, going to be an interesting one. So I'll put this across your screen, and I am going to show you what the banks think in a second. I'm going to show you what ASB, Westpac, BNZ, ANZ, I'm going to show you what they all think. But before I show you the numbers, I actually want to get a sense of what you guys think. Sometimes in the past, I've shown you the bank's forecasts, and then I ask you what you think, and usually you just tell me whatever the bank said. Um, mm. So I'm really interested in getting your guys' understanding of what you think is going to happen. Is it going to be, are they going to fall? Are they going to go up 0 to 4%? Are they going to go up 4 to 8%? Or perhaps greater than 8%? I've had almost 950 of you guys respond to that, and we are going to end that in 5, 4, 3, two and one. I'm going to end that poll and share those results with you. So we've got about 10% of people saying we think house prices are going to go up by 8% or more next year. Most of you, 52%, the majority, over 500 investors here today are saying 4 to 8% increase next year. 35% of you are saying 0 to 4% and about 4% of you are saying they're going to fall. Now, what's interesting is you could all be right about your specific area, right? Because in a place like Whangarei, property prices are still falling, even though at the national level, at the national average, property prices bottomed down in May, but right now in Whangarei, they're still falling, which is a relatively major city here in New Zealand. Uh, in other places, perhaps property prices never went down that much, so maybe they will stabilise over the next year. That could be in a place like perhaps Queenstown, just for example. So I'm not saying you guys who are saying property prices are going to uh, fall, perhaps you could be right in your specific area. But just before we get into question time, I want to show you what the banks actually think. And uh, one thing that's quite interesting is that in my, um, I do a weekly column for One Roof, and one of my recent ones was why are the bank's house predictions all so far apart and why are they all different? And in that article, I show this table here. I've updated it based on the latest data. But you can see that there is a real spread in what the banks think is going to happen. Westpac's latest prediction is that in 2024, house prices are going to go up 8%. So you guys who said 8% or more, Westpac's on your side, right? They, they're thinking really similarly. They think we're going to see a, quite a large increase. ASB, they're saying 7.3%. One thing that's just a little bit interesting is that up until only a couple of days ago, 
ASB's most recent forecast was that property prices were only going to go up about 2.5, 2.7%. So they've really increased theirs uh, just in the last couple of days when they released their latest forecast. It's big. They're, they're all above 5%. All the banks above 5%. That's pretty significant. Yeah, it's some pretty significant growth that they expect to see. The Reserve Bank just updated their forecast, I think it was last week. Um, it went from about 2.7% up to 5.2%. The Treasury, they didn't release their one. I mean, they're the latest one, September 2023. Uh, not the latest, they're the, the earliest forecast on here, 1.6% back then. But if you average it out, the average is about 5.7%. The median is about 6%. So that just gives you a sense of where a lot of financial institutions are at when they're thinking about property price growth next year. And I think when you add it all up, although we see demand side factors, although we see supply side factors, next year, all of the changes that the government's making is probably going to increase demand more than supply, which is why we're seeing not only quite healthy house price predictions out of the banks, but we're also seeing them raise them. With just in the last week, Westpac, ASB and the Reserve Bank increasing their house price predictions compared to what they were previously forecasting. And that's leading a lot of investors to say, hey, look, I'm thinking about investing in property. Now, look, we are going to get into the Q&A in a second, but I know a lot of you guys here are brand new tonight. You've never met us before. And what's interesting is that even if you have been here for a while, a lot of people say, even after listening to over 1,500 podcasts, coming along to 50 webinars, subscribing to the Property Investor magazine and reading our book, people still ask, what is it that you guys actually do here at Opus Partners. So I just want to take two minutes before we get into question time to let you know what we actually do here uh, other than just talking to you at our webinars. There are two main things we do. The first thing is we help investors create a property investment plan, a plan about how they are actually going to invest in property. And what you can see there is a little video of Andrew sitting on his hotel floor in the QT Hotel in Auckland when he was sitting down with a property investor creating their passive income plan. And you can see that's a piece of our software there, My Wealth Plan, that we use to create property investment portfolios. On top of that, once we've created a plan, we go out and find new build properties for you, right? So we've got some new build properties that you can buy through us here at Opus Partners and our sister companies. And on the right, you can see an example of Andrew showing a property to an investor on a Zoom call when he's sitting at home. That was probably on a Saturday night, talking away to investors about what they could invest in. So those are the two things we do here at Opus Partners. But it's important to say, you don't have to use us, right? So we're one type, we're one example of a property investment company, but there are lots of others you could use. And if you go to Google and type that in, yeah, we're at the top because um, we're, we're probably one of the largest ones, but there are others too. There's Propeller there, uh, there's Positive Real Estate. Uh, I think we've put uh, a Property Factory on there as well. There are lots of people that you could use. And it's important to do your research. But a lot of people then say, well, if there are lots of people, if there are lots of property investment companies I could potentially use, why might I use you guys here at Opus Partners? And there are four major reasons. The first is we use a lot of data to make good decisions. And you've seen tonight the amount of data we've gone through. We've probably gone through about 10 charts, looking at the numbers, trying to figure out what is going to happen. That's something you get if you come to us because I think we are one of the only property investment companies that have an in-house economist. Um, hi, that's me. <laughs> the second thing we often do is we've got properties you can't find on TradeMe. Because we sign contracts, agencies, with developers through our company, uh, Opus Property, in order to be able to have properties that you just, we don't put on Trade Me because we're seeing clients all the time and our investors purchase them. We often don't put them on Trade Me. There's a couple on there, just as examples so people can see. But most of our properties, we don't bother putting on Trade Me because our investors that we work with, our clients, they just purchase them from us. We don't have to put them on Trade Me. The third thing we really focus on is looking and finding good prices and good deals. So what you're looking at, at there on the left hand side is in every property we show an investor, we show them how that property compares to other properties on the market. So the one that we're recommending here in Phillipstown, that's worth $539,000 or that's the purchase price on it. And here we've got a comparison and we're showing is this actually a good property? How do you as the investor know that this is a good price and it is a good deal? Well, the only way to prove that is to show you it. And so in every property that you look at from us, you will see an example of this with the numbers so you can make up your own mind and we're proving to you that it's a good deal. 
And the last thing is we've got all the support you need in one place. So we can help you find the property. We can help you find the right new build. We can manage it through Opus Property Management. We can help you get the mortgage through Opus Mortgages. We can help you get the accounting sorted or your tax returns sorted from Opus Accounting. So it's about giving you everything you need so you can get it all in one place and you can just uh, have it a little bit easier. Now, if you are interested in working with us, I'm going labour on too much about it, what I do want to offer you is a portfolio planning session. And there's no cost for this, it's a free meeting. And that is where you'll do what we mentioned before, which is create a property investment plan, either with Andrew or with another one of our financial advisors. And that's the example when he was sitting down on the QT floor. Now, if you're interested in this, and you can't wait and do it next year, um, I'm going to put a final poll across your screen. And if you click the top one, we'll send you a link to book a meeting. And if you're not into it and you think, actually, I'm not that interested, no trouble, just click the bottom one, you won't get a link and we won't call you to book something in. Uh, you can say, yes, I'm keen for the meeting um, and say, hey, I'll just book it in next year if that's okay. We can send you the link to do it and I'll just put that final poll across your screen. So you've got the option to either say, yes, I'm keen to talk to you guys or actually, it's not the right time for me. I'm not that interested. We won't be offended either way. Yeah, and that can, that can uh, as Ed says, we'll, we'll be in contact to make a time that's going to work for you. doesn't have to be right away, but this will reserve a spot for you because I can promise you this. Next February, and at the end of January and February, it's going to get pretty gnarly. There's going to be a lot of competition out there. So if you are even thinking about it, get a wealth plan put together. You don't have to implement it straight away, but at least you've got a plan in place. I think that's the most important thing. We often talk about the need of having a plan, and I think everybody knows that, hey, you actually do need a plan if you're going to be successful with money. We all agree with that. Most people don't have a written down plan. And the really cool thing about that portfolio planning session is you walk away with a written down plan that you can actually use. And if you decide that you don't want to work with us, you don't want to buy a property through our service, totally fine. At least you then have that written down plan. Now, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, yeah. So I think Luke said, um, if you charge nothing, how do you get paid? So I'll just clarify that. So if someone comes and gets all of our advice, that part's absolutely free. If then you decide you want to buy a property from our um, from our, our real estate team, they've all been pre-vetted by us, and we're going to receive a real estate fee for that. So you get that you get the advice for free, and you buy a property like you would a normal real estate service. So you get all of that part absolutely free. If you decide to use our mortgage service, we get paid from the bank, insurance broking, get paid by the insurer. If you use our property management or our accounting service, there are fees for that, which we'll talk to you about. Yeah, and Lisa asked a really good question. Are the new builds that we recommend, are they off the plan or are they already built? There's usually a mix of both. Now, just before we get into the question time, before some of you guys head off, because I know some people go at eight o'clock, Couple of extra pieces of content. So if you are keen to learn more and you don't already, listen to the Property Academy podcast. Every single day we release a brand new episode to teach you something new about property. Episode 1552 went live today. Episode 1553 goes live tomorrow. Uh, on top of that, you should also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Every week we release two new videos on Monday and Wednesday. One's from the podcast, one is me talking about something else, and we often dig into the data. It's, it's just a great way to learn about property if you're into YouTube. Or well, the final thing you could do is buy our book, Wealth Plan. It's currently in bookstores, or you can get it at wealthplanbook.com. We ship it for free all around New Zealand. Right, that's the end of the webinar, but what we always do is we stick around for about another 20 minutes to answer all of your questions because we've got over 99 Holy sitting moly. there in the chat. Now, Andrew, you've been keeping your eye on them as we've been going. What are some of the ones that are, you're really interested in right now? Anonymous attendee said, has the best time to buy a house passed or... Are we still in that time period? Which is a great question. Why are you sitting back oh, like this? I'm, I'm as just, if you're I'm, in a lounge yeah, chair. Yeah, we I'm, are on a professional webinar. And yeah, you're, it's I, like could you're lean, a, I could lean back for it. It's like you're at a lazy boy. Well, you're not showing off your best Shh. look. Um, so, uh, the best time was yesterday, uh, but the next best time is today. So I kind of think, look, um, depending on where you're buying at the moment, there might be some upward movement in prices. Auckland has had its fifth month of growth in a row. Um, so arguably, the, well not arguably, the bottom of the market was five months ago. If you wanted the best possible price, it was five months ago. But that doesn't mean you can't buy today because if you just think, oh, I missed the bottom of the market, the next bottom of the market is in 15 years' time or 10 years' time. So don't wait for that because it's going to be a whole lot more expensive than it is today. Um, there's a really good question from Jade who asked, why was the 90-day rule implemented? 
and, I, and what she's talking about there, or he might be talking about there, is why was that rule brought in so that you could get rid of a tenant with 90 day notice? Now, I'm not sure whether you've been why, whether why was it taken away or was it why was it brought in in the first place? I'll answer both. The reason it was brought in in the first place was to give you as a property investor a little bit of comfort so that if something went wrong with your tenant, there was some antisocial behaviour, it turned out that they were using drugs, they weren't paying um, uh, their rent on time or if they were a bit disrespectful to you or whatever it happened to be, you just had that option to get rid of them. Now, why was it that Labor took that away? The main reason is they wanted to give some extra protection to tenants. So they were worried that property investors were using it to may perhaps discriminate or, or get rid of tenants in an unfair way. That was their view on things. Um, and so that's the reason why they took it away. That's something you often see talked about uh, in the media. Is there anything else you're jumping in, Andrew, or do you want me to rattle on? Uh, no, I will actually, um, Shelley asked, um, if my tenant has a pet, does that mean they'll have to pay a new additional bond, or is this just for new tenancies? This is for new tenancies. So if you've already got a tenant that you've already agreed to have a, a pet, then that doesn't actually apply. Um, just some of the other easy ones I can answer nice and quickly. Someone, quite a few questions around um, ring fencing. Will they abolish ring fencing, so allow you to offset your losses against personal income? Not at this stage. There's not any talk about that at this stage. Maybe in the future, maybe if there's, uh, maybe in the next few years, if there's a lot of upward pressure on rents, that might be something the government look, looks at. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it anytime soon. Um, someone's asked. Um, uh, Jenny said, are there any better rules for first-time buyers? I think the triple CFA will really help first-time buyers. That's probably the biggest part that's going to really help first-time buyers. There's a really interesting thing just on first-time buyers, obviously around KiwiBuild. So one thing that oh. the national government are going to do is they are going to scrap KiwiBuild. So, so that is the policy where at the moment there are slightly cheaper properties uh, for first-time buyers available because in order to get some additional support or some protection from the government, developers need to provide properties at a certain price level. Look, we were seeing a lot of property developers move away from using KiwiBuild anyway, so it may not have too much of an impact there, but at the margin there will be some property developers uh, who might hike up the price of their properties a little bit because they're getting rid of KiwiBuild. Um, so someone asked, uh, is the 90 days also applicable to fixed term tenancies? So if you've got a tenancy which is a one year fixed contract, no. So your one year fixed contract is a one year fixed contract. What The one thing around that though is that actually genuinely means a one year fixed contract. So at the moment, a one year fixed contract rolls over to periodic and then you've got to follow the, the current process to get rid of a tenancy, which is again much more complicated. Um, someone asked, uh, oh, can that be a fixed term tenancy? So no, no. Hayden's got a really good question. He said, are debt to income ratio restrictions going to come in? If so, what will the ratio be? Now, nobody knows for sure, but I expect they probably will come in. There was a really interesting article this morning where maybe Nicola Willis, uh, the now finance minister, was questioning that a little bit. I expect they probably will come in. The Reserve Bank has got the legal authority to do it. They're consulting on it. I expect it will be somewhere between probably around the third quarter next year, somewhere between July and September. Now, they haven't announced what the ratio is going to be. Uh, they'll do that at the time. I expect that it's probably going to be a seven times debt to income ratio. That's the one I believe is most likely. It could be a six times debt to income ratio. I Just before Andrew goes, I want to say hello to Gillian, uh, who has been a long time listener and long time follower of us here. Gillian, I haven't seen you at too many webinars recently. Maybe I've missed you, but I just want to say hello. Uh, Keith asked, the devil is in the detail with pet bonds. What happens if they force us to take pets? Now, Keith, there's a really good article, uh, sorry, podcast on this. You can search it on our, web, uh, on our archives on our website. Uh, look, as a landlord, actually, you can't really refuse a, a, a bit. Sorry, you can't really refuse a pet anyway if it's reasonable. Um, and there's been actually quite a few uh, uh, cases with the tenancy tribunal where people have gone ahead and got pets or, or wanted to get pets, and the, the tenancy tribunals ruled in their favour anyway. So having a pet bond actually just gives you a level of protection so you can say yes without having to worry about it too much. There was an anonymous attendee who said, if I buy an existing property today as an investment property, what will my tax deductibility be for the mm. current tax year? Now, I'm going to give you two answers because actually it's a little bit grey at the moment because the law hasn't been passed. If you read what the National Act Coalition Agreement says, it would be 
That's what it says in the coalition agreement. But there are some articles coming out at the moment where uh, nationals may be asking a few more, bit more questions, being a bit more coy about that. The rule as it stands today is you would have no tax deductibility unless you rent it out as social housing. So if you rent, if you buy a property today existing, rent it out uh, on the open market, get a property manager, find a tenant yourself, and it's not social housing, 0% straight away. But they are saying, or the coalition agreement says, that they'll introduce a bill that will retrospectively apply 60%. We will see if that actually happens. There's a little bit of risk if you go ahead and do that today. What else are you seeing, Andrew? Um, I accidentally started, uh, answer, uh, I selected one and, and got rid of it. So um, someone asked the question, if I buy a property with 800,000 tag at 650 a week rent, I assume I'm borrowing 100%. How long will the top up last for? Um, the top up, will pretty, uh, if it's finished now, the top up might be for the next few years and then you might have a top up but it'll be significantly less in a few years time. It really depends on how long interest rates stay at this high level and that depends on inflation. Um, but our modelling is probably that for the next few years it might be a reasonable will top up um, by by years four, five, and six. It's probably nominal. And by year seven or eight, you might be positively geared. Uh, Lydia has asked a great question. I'll answer it in case any of you guys are thinking of the same same thing. She said, how much does it cost to sign up with you guys after the free meeting? Again, there is no additional cost for any of the advice because if you buy a new build property through us, we're going to charge the developer. Some property investment companies decide to charge you guys as well. So they might charge you and the developer. We've decided not to do that because we want to help as many people as possible. Uh, of course, if you use our property management company or our accounting company and we do your tax returns, there is a charge for that. I, th I think we're pretty uh, good in the market. We charge 7.99% plus GST for property management and we charge uh, 1350 plus GST for accounting for your first property. And then 250 thereafter. Um, there's a lot of questions around what happens if Labor get a next election? Are they going to go and undo all of these changes again? What's your thoughts on that? Oh, who knows, really? I think that I, my feeling of it, and I remember talking, I think I was talking to Stuff about this when they called me up and asked me the same question, is I don't think we're going to see infrastructure repealed again. That was something that was quite a surprise for a lot of property investors. I remember the day it happened and everybody was freaking out because nobody expected it to happen. Remember, a lot of the policies that were introduced over the last three years, between 2020 and 2023, that was when Labor had a historic majority. Mm. You know, they had over 50% of the seats in the parliament, and so they had a lot of flexibility to come out and introduce these sort of laws. Now, if they were to get in again, and perhaps it's with the Greens uh, and Te Pāti Māori, look, those are the sort of parties that, that might say, hey, we want to take it away. My gut feeling is to say, probably not, but you never know, um, because that's three years in the future. Future, potentially six, potentially nine years in the future. We don't know yet. We'll see what happens. And you've got to remember, it was not only unpopular from a landlord's perspective, but Treasury and the IRD both said, do not implement this policy. So this was go the government went against the advice of its peers. Uh, let's see, there was another interesting one. Uh, Jenny says, if we bought a property a month ago and it was a rental property, then we fix it uh, Then we fix it up for the healthy home rules and rent it out, let's say, early next year. Will the bright line come off this instantly when the government removed the, removed the bright line or not? The answer is no. You, will, you bought it last month, so you bought that in November 2023. You will have a two-year bright line test, which means your bright line test will expire in uh, November 2025. Uh, so you will still have a bright line test. It's not going completely. It's just shortened down to two years. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Um, will there be interest deductibility for short-term rentals like Airbnb? My understanding is yes. Uh, that will be coming back, uh, just like how it came off when we saw uh, that to be the case. Um, there's a really good question from uh, Shweta, uh, who said, can I access any of your old seminars? And the answer is yes, and I'll just show you where those are, because we've got an absolute treasure trove of content uh, that you guys can access. So if you go to, whoops, let me just get that back. If you go to our website, which is openspartners.co.nz, and you go up to series, you can go to webinar, and you can watch all of our previous sessions. We call these Property Live, and they go all the way back to 2021. We've got about 50 odd of them, and you can go all the way back, 
it's just loading here, to April 2020, where uh, wow. I was in my bedroom. I uh, was at the batch. Andrew was at the batch. So we've got all of them up there. The only one that's not up there was last uh, last month's one, because producer David, who's sitting over here uh, to your left, it'll be, um, he was away on holiday in, in Indonesia, selfishly, and so wasn't <laughs> able to be here uh, to edit that for you. Um, one other thing I do want to mention is there's just a treasure trove of stuff on here. Uh, we've got our article section. You guys should definitely check this out. We publish new articles every single week, usually about three of them. I can see we've just released our um, What's a Good Gross Yield in New Zealand. That's a great article. Where do house prices go up faster, small towns, larger cities? And we've also got a significant amount of data in Data Hub. So you can see capital growth, interest rates. You see so much stuff in there. Uh, if you want to learn more, great place to check it out. What else is um, tickling your fancy in there, Andrew? We'll probably um, do um, maybe maybe three more questions okay. and then we'll wrap it up. I'll just do a couple of easy ones. Is the vacant land still subject to bright line test? Yes, it is. So anything that's not your own home under the own home exemption is subject to the bright line. Um, Hayden asked another great question. I might have already answered it, but if you purchased rental property six months ago, what percentage tax deductibility do I currently pay? If you're renting to get out to a normal tenant, i.e. not social housing, 0%. You get no tax deductibility because you bought it after March 2021. You get nothing straight away. Um, you, it could be retrospectively applied, subject to all of the things I talked about previously. Um, um, somebody asked uh, a really good question, which is, is there a webinar or article which shows house prices, OCR, number of sales, immigration numbers, all on the same chart? <laughs> the answer is no, and I wouldn't do that, and I'll tell you the reason why. It's because, generally speaking, you don't want to put too many data points on one chart, um, so you wouldn't want to put everything on there all at the same time. Um, I could consider doing something. Probably the best thing that I'd get you to read is if you go to our website and check out our New Zealand property market update. And you can actually use the search function up here to find anything on our website. If you just look at property market, let's see what comes up. Hopefully what, I, what I'm hoping comes up, comes up. Imagine if it doesn't stop uploading, Andrew, and then I'm get, I'll get all embarrassed. Oh, let's see if I just look for articles. Embarrassing us in public again. I know, I'm going to be terribly embarrassed. Oh, it's not coming up. I know what the URL is, so I'm just going to go there anyway. If you go to our New Zealand property market update, which is openspartners.co.nz slash property hyphen markets, um, this has got... Did you get that all? This has got the latest and most up-to-date data. I update it every time we get a... Uh, new update to what's happening to interest rates, you know, where have property prices fallen most, all of that stuff. That's probably the best place to get that constant update. Marcus said, interested to hear your thoughts on net migration and how it's going to play out with the new PM's comments recently um, and the knock-on effect for demand. Uh, I would say that most uh, new residents to New Zealand are unlikely to buy a house. Most. Some will buy a house, but most of them probably won't. So there will be an increased demand for rentals, particularly in Auckland. So Auckland gets a disproportionate number of uh, new migrants because that's where the jobs are. Fantastic. Radio, we are going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much for being with us. It is awesome that there are still over uh, 750 people here right now still on the webinar. Thank you so much for being with us. It's awesome that we've got a culture in New Zealand where people are willing to stay up late on a Tuesday night right before Christmas to learn about property investment. I think that's so good of you. So thanks for being with us. It's great to have so many of you new guys here. And we will see you next, uh, not next month, next month's January. We're going to be back in February with another session of Property Life. Thanks so much, team.